We may never get out of here, but we're going to live for the Lord while we're here and witness for Christ. And one of them heard a tape up there and said, uh, Oh, isn't that wonderful? Just think he called himself a junkyard dog. <laughs> and Mrs. White said, I know what tape she was listening to because nobody called themselves that. That's how those prisoners look at it, you know. That's why I look at it, too. I'm with them. I'm with them. All right, now, if you have a Bible tonight, I'm glad you got to hear something about your missionary money. Now, you got to hear something about something about tonight, see? All that money you've been pouring the mission, that isn't, that isn't down the drain. That's a better investment than Wall Street. The Dow Jones average goes down 500 points. It ain't going to affect that a bit. All right, if you got a Bible there, turn to Matthew chapter 13. I'll make it 25, Matthew 25, and Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 and Matthew 25. Now, this is a very negative message tonight. And this message has to do with uh, God's description of the lost. And I want to have you understand, the time I start, the time I finish, I'm not giving you my opinion about what I think lost people are like or what's going to happen to lost people. I'm going to give the Scripture. And we'll start tonight there in Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, notice how it starts. Now, this is what the book says about unsaved people. In the average church today, you don't hear much distinction between the saved and the lost, or much discussion about it. But it's all through that book. It just goes to show how much how, how men have abandoned the book. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was what? Lost. Why, yeah, lost. A man out, he goes out there, he goes out to find the lost sheep. Well, who are these people? Lost. Uh, if the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost, something lost. And it needs to be saved. And he's not talking about lives there. He said one time, he said, What shall a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Lose. Talk about loss. We're not talking about losing your income or losing your wife or losing your health. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about you making a mess of things. We're talking about your soul. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. That's what's involved. All right, in Ephesians chapter 2 there, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, let your eye down, run down there through verse 1, 2, and 3. Now, the Lord wrote that passage. I didn't write it. If you would get mad at me for preaching the Bible and get mad at you for preaching the Bible, you have no right to get mad at me for preaching the Bible. I didn't write the Bible. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, or 2, uh, verse 1 to 3 there. See what you're calling that passage? You were by nature a child of wrath... What could that refer to? Uh, the children of disobedience. The Spirit now worketh the children of disobedience. Who is that? Must be somebody that's you. Passage says, by nature, by birth, first birth, you're a child of wrath. Oh, God wouldn't hurt these little boys and girls. No, they're still little boys and girls. They're innocent. But you're not innocent. It's all right to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they're weak, but he is strong. Sure, that's all right, but they're little ones. And you ain't. That Bible said you must be born again. Why? Because the first birth is no good. Look down there, verse 12 and 13, for some more of it. Now, it's Paul writing, 12 and 13. That's the Apostle Paul. Before a man saved, you know what Paul says he is? He says he's alone, and he's alone in the world without hope and without God. That's the statement. Now, you wouldn't gather that just meeting people, just talking to people. Some folks nice and polite, good folks. But that isn't what that book says about them. It says a man is lost, he's a child of disobedience, he's a child of wrath, he's in the world with no hope and no God. That's the book. I said, don't get upset with me. I didn't write that cotton-picking thing. I wouldn't have written that. I met some folks I thought were real nice, including myself. <laughs> I've always thought very highly of myself, and most people think very highly of themselves. That doesn't mean anything what you think about it, what it says. All right, now, I'm talking here about the, uh, talking about, uh, the condition of an unsaved man. Over there in Russia, well, in Romania, actually, where a Harlan Pop, uh, Popoff was, well, a Harlan Popoff was in Bulgaria, and, uh, a Wormf Worm Rant was in, in, uh, in Romania. And those fellows were preaching over there when the communists came in. And when the communists came in, uh, they said for a couple of months, they looked like everything was going all right. Nothing to worry about. 
the preachers were allowed to preach. And they got up to Sunday and preached, and there wasn't any problem. Now they noticed something. They noticed that as long as they preached about God as love and God as good, they didn't get any static. But once they started saying the devil was bad, and the pastor disappeared and appeared at the court trial, and the church was shut down after a while, and pretty soon all the church shut down. What was wrong? Negative preaching. You got a thing going on in America right now where they're getting ready to say that if I get up here in this pulpit and preach what that book says about faggots and sex perverts and queers, that you can arrest the people who didn't find this church because it upsets somebody. The thing is today that you're getting in a situation where the preachers are not allowed to upset anybody. You've got to get along. You don't offend anybody. That well, You wouldn't be a preacher then. You'd be a politician. Well, I'd be the last man to be that. Now, you take that thing right there, as long as it's positive, okay. If it's negative, then, uh uh-uh. I'm allowed to preach all the verses of the Bible, John 3, 16. That's just wonderful. That's just wonderful. God is so loved, positive, the world He gave, that's positive. His only begotten Son, positive. Who shall believe, positive, not perish, positive, but have everlasting life. Good. Now, cool. Matthew 25, verse 41. I'm going to preach this. Suppose I preach this. I preach John 3, 16, but not this one. Matthew 25, 41. I didn't say this one. The Son that God gave said that verse. You like Christ dying for you? Okay, you better listen to him. Matthew twenty five forty one. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What's that? Ain't that positive? Ain't that beautiful? Depart, you cursed. You're damned. Get out of here and don't come back. Depart from me. Who is that? Well, come on, somebody. It didn't set in the thin air. <laughs> Who is that? Can you really, can you name any of them? Are you one of them? Or it couldn't be me. Well, then who is it if it ain't you? It's somebody. Or he wouldn't have said it. That's what's going on. All right, sometime they t- there are six, uh, 600,000 words in the English language, according to Webster's Dictionary. A big one, 600,000. And one time a bunch of fellows got together and they decided to decide what is the most terrible word in the English language. And they had all kinds of suggestions. Here's a Dos Passos, a writer. He said the worst, the most horrible word in the English language is forlorn. One of them said the most meninger, the, the shrink. Meninger out there in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, he's the king of the American shrinks, abnormal psychiatrist. He said, he said the, the most terrible word in the English language is unloved. Oscar Hammerstein, <clears throat> that's a songwriter, a writer of musical comedies and plays and things. The worst word in English language is but, the negation, so and so, but, such and such. Tolstoy, the Russian writer, said the most terrible word in English language is atheism. Bernard Baruch, the politician, said the worst uh, uh, word in English language is hopeless. Truman said the worst thing is saying it might have been. But I've got a word that has all those things in it. Lost. What does that mean? Gone. Forever. You don't get it back. Whatever it is. Lost. That's being forlorn. That's being in a position where you've got no God to help you. Lost. You might have got to heaven with Christ, but it's got all those words in it. L-O-S-T. Well, that's what we try to do in our preaching. We try to get lost people saved. That's what they're doing over there in Moldova, and that's what we do here in the street when we preach. You say, well, you're never going to win the Christ that kind of preach. They're never going to be interested in accepting Christ unless they know the condition. And the average lost person doesn't know the condition. They don't think they are lost. When they said these things about them, and, and these things are true, I mean, first of all, they're spiritually dead. Oh... Uh, they're spiritually dead, and so they need to be. They need to be brought back to life. A loss means uh, you're going to die without hope, and without God. Why right, the book says God so loved the world He gave. Well, that's true. What you know, those Buddhists, they don't believe God loved enough and die for them. What you know, with Muhammad, are you a Muslim? Your God didn't die for you. He never even showed up down here. And your prophet didn't die for you either. He didn't give a flip about you. Muhammad didn't die for anybody. He wouldn't die for one of his 14 wives. 
Here might a nine-year-old girl, and he wouldn't die for her. I know somebody who would die for you. All right, then when we talk about loss, we're talking about somebody. And if that Bible's right, we're talking about millions. We ain't talking about one or two bad folks. We're talking about millions. Oh, that saying is that big, big parade. You know, God loves gays, too. You know, that kind of thing. You know, and uh, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. How many ever heard that? Let me see your hands. That's a fable. Where'd you get that from? Well, God so loved the world, you got your tents kind of messed up, don't you? You want the tents? He that believeth on the Son, present tense, hath everlasting life. He that believes not the Son, present tense. He that believes not the Son hath not life, and the wrath of God abides, present tense, on him. You got a funny Bible. All fundamentalists are screwed up on that, just like the unsaved people are screwed on it. They talk about God loving the sinner to make him feel like his love. He was loved. Was. You say, well, at Calvary. The sinner wants to get around Calvary. So God loves me even having been to Calvary. No, he doesn't. God so loved, past tense. He gave, past tense. Here in his love, not that we love God, past tense, but that he loved us and gave his son. We love him because he first, past tense, loved us. God with his great will love wherewith he loved us has the past tense. You know what that means? That means before you were talking about God loving you, God doesn't love you anywhere except where his son died for your sins. And if you haven't been there, don't talk about God loving you. That book says the wrath of God abides on him. So I don't, so I don't feel it. Dead man don't feel nothing. The Bible said you're without hope, without, without God. And the Bible said you were dead in trespass and sin. A dead man don't feel anything. A dead man don't feel nothing. You know, you know what people mistake in the, in, in, in the age today of which you live in? They mistake mercy. Mercy and delayed judgment as love. You know why you think God loves you when you're lost? Because He hasn't killed you yet. And He's given you food and given you clothing and given you friends. That's proof He loves you. See? See how it goes? That's how it goes. Now some men throw that book out the window. They get rid of a holy God and they figure, why, sure, God loves me. Look how good He's been to me. You mean how merciful He's been to you? Mercy is not positive, brethren. Mercy is negative. Mercy is God not giving you what you had coming to you. That isn't love. That isn't love. Love's positive. He said he said, he said one place there in Ephesians, he says he loved the church. How? Like a man is supposed to love his wife, Adam and Eve, type of Christ in the church. That ain't mercy. That's positive. That's love. Now, you take that thing I'm talking about, this thing is crucial. Because the preachers are quit preaching that really, really God's mad at anybody. He just mad at their sins. Quote, Jacob have I loved. Esau have I what? Hey. What? Hey. Where'd you get that from? You didn't get it from me. Well, it's in the Bible twice. Malachi chapter 1, Romans chapter 9. Well, Jesus loved me this I know. Yeah, the kids can sing that because they're innocent. You ain't innocent. <laughs> he believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him, abideth on him, whether you feel it or not. Now, number one, an unsaved man is spiritually dead. That's the first thing. You say, how do you know that? Because he said you must be born again. If you're born, must be born again, you're born, born wrong the first time. Bible said in that passage you're reading, you got Ephesians 2 there. Turn back to Ephesians 2, look at that thing. Didn't you read a thing right there that said, uh, You have he quickened who were dead in trespass and sin? Is that the first or second verse? First verse. You have he quickened, look, at, underline it, who were dead. The zombies walking around. No, they don't feel the wrath of God on The dead man don't feel anything. He just moves around. That's what that thing is. Aren't they spiritually dead? The text is hard to believe. It's so hard to believe because people just can't believe that good people are really just dead people. At least spirit, they can't believe it. 
very difficult. Uh, it looks so real sometimes. I mean, I know a lot of nice, polite, sweet, courteous people in this world with high standards, ethical and moral standards. Some of them are better than Christians. And they're just as lost as golf ball and high weeds. You take that thing, that self-righteousness, that thing will fix you, fix you good. And you take a, you, you ever see a woman with these artificial birds and flowers on her hat? Well, some of those birds look so real, you think that you hear them chirp in a minute. I've gone by a, a smorgasbord and made the mistake of picking some grapes that weren't grapes. <laughs> they were wax. <laughs> You ever see that? They got them just a decoration there on the table. You know where the stuff is? I thought it was real grapes. The thing can look real, but it's dead. They had a live bird in that woman's hat or a live flower. They're dead. An unsaved man is spiritually dead, the book says. And some of them, are, they have a zeal of God, Paul says, but not according to knowledge. A zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Some of the unsaved people are zealous and religious, much more religious than some of you. Weren't the Pharisees? The Pharisees are more religious than anybody you know, and there wasn't a one of them saved. One of them said, I thank God I'm not like other men. I'm not unjust. I'm even not, I'm not like this publican, he said. I tithe and I fast and I tithe two times a week and give alms of all that I possess. Oh, the fellow was a, he was a good, moral, righteous man and just a loss of goose in a horse race. They're spiritually dead. And all over the world they do penance. They walk on while you turn, watch the Catholics in the Philippines. They get on the street and whip themselves every Easter. Got blood running down the back. They crucify a fellow by putting him up on a cross. They have been doing with ropes. In the last couple of years they've been nailing him, putting nails through him. Well, a fellow willing to go through that, wouldn't God pay attention to that? Not a bit. You say, why? The blood's no good. Wrong blood. Your blood. Your blood ain't worth nothing. If it was, you'd stay alive. And some are very zealous. He's a zealous, but not according to knowledge. They got the wrong kind of zeal is what they got. And that's what's going on. You take you take over in India, up in Kashmir, that's northern India. Uh, up up there, uh, the year, uh, year, uh, up there every year, 25,000 Hindus climb up a mountain at an elevation of 13,000 feet to worship a piece of ice. Takes them a seven day trip to get up there. A uh, four day trip. Take them, t- they only going to go seven miles a day for four days up the steep incline. And the Sandhus, that's the, the beggars, the professional beggar men over there in India, the poor pariah Sandhus that are begging all the time and supposed to have attained samadhi and gotten in contact with the infinite and all that stuff. They make fun of those pilgrims going up there because the way to get samadhi in nirvana is meditation. And the fellows who can't get up there by meditation and by yoga, they have them go up there and take a trip up there and worship this piece of ice school. It's just a lactite, this cave up there. And they get to the bottom of the mountain and they wash themselves in the holy water and they go up there 13,000 feet and get in this cave. And in this cave, on the full moon, on the full moon, the stalactite gets its highest uh, uh, angle. It's a vertical stalactite that I guess call them a stalagmite. It comes from the bottom like this, up in the air, five feet tall. That's a phallic symbol, of course, what it is. And those people go there, and they, and what they're trying to do, they're trying to prepare themselves for death. They can hope they can sever earthly attachments before they die. And so they quit, uh, they give up their uh, meat, and give, uh, give up alcohol, and give up eat eggs and all that stuff, and hope and hope and hope, positive thinking, boy. Power of positive thinking, buddy. And hope and hope and hope it'll be all right, and hope and hope it'll be all right. I mean, look what I'm going, do I'm doing, God, you know. It isn't accepted. Paul said, they have a zeal of God, Romans 10, but not according to knowledge. Now, there's people who are spiritually dead doing that stuff. And I mean, they're working themselves silly over that stuff, and it isn't doing any good. I know many Catholics are just as sincere and just as religious and just as ethical and moral as any Christian, or more so, and they sincerely believe, and you think, well, if I sincerely believe, but you see, you're not dealing with what God said in that book. In that book, he said, Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Paul says, In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You forgot self-righteousness. And if you're just sincere as you can be and self-righteous, you ain't going to make it because you ain't good enough to make it. You may have been sincere, but you're kidding yourself. You talk yourself into it. 
Well, I never killed anybody. I never nothing wrong. I'm not allowed to lie, lie to these people. I know a lot of Christians do this, and I wouldn't do this, and that kind of stuff. That's what they do. That's what they do. Listen, that Bible doesn't say you go to hell. Doesn't say you go to hell and you're lost because you live like the devil. It says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to what? No say it again. No say it again. No I don't remember what that way is. Is that flipping beads and lighting candles and saying Hail Mary? That's your way. It isn't God's way. If climb up a 13-foot, 1,000-foot mountain over in Kashmir is your way, that isn't God's way either. There's a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Yeah, yeah good, good. I, I appreciate having an audience that uh, is uh, up with me. Boy, I've been in many a place where I said, uh, God so loved the world, gave him love to God's Son, whoever believed him should not. They couldn't put the word in. In churches. No kidding, man. Really. Like, really, man. I'll say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Uh-uh, not these places. It's just, uh, <laughs> you don't know what the book says. And Bob, look it up. You look it up. If you've got it, see you looked at it. <laughs> Spiritually dead. I want to tell you the second thing about these people. They're without hope. They're without hope. You realize what that means then to be without hope? I know a lady that didn't one time. I've got her, I've got her testimony back there. Florence Littiver. Florence Litter was one of these Yankees up in Connecticut someplace. They came up in a poor home. She made up her mind someday she's going to be rich. And she made up her mind just what she's going to do. And she's one of those girls that just have a steadfast mind where if whatever she's going to put in operation, she got it going. And she made up her mind, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to do this, I'm going to make money and go to college, I'm going to Wait till I get out of college before I get married. When I get married, I'm going to marry a rich man. And then I'm going to do this and that. And she did it. And she got, got, her dad was a, I think it was some kind of work with, uh, some kind of a tailor or something. Poor part of a little old town in Connecticut they lived in. And she worked, got her way up and then worked away and got a scholarship to go to a big university, went to the big university. And she got there and when she graduated, she married a rich fellow and they came in a couple of million dollars and everything worked just fine. And one day I had a little boy, and the little boy got to be about, uh, about two years old, began to have fits and spasms and things and jerks and cry in the bed at night and foam with the mouth and that kind of thing. And she took him to a doctor, and I forget the name of the disease was that uh, he had. But anyway, he looked him over, and he called her in after the thorough examination and said, I, I could tell you this, but your boy's got such and such and named the disease and said his case is hopeless. And she said, well, that's silly. He said, what do you mean? He said, nothing hopeless. See that old positive thinking? Right there to mess you up, boy. And she said, nothing hopeless. And she wanted a second opinion. She figured he lied to her. So she got a second opinion. And the doctor looked the kid over and made some more examinations, different kind the other fellow made. And when he got through, he said, I'm sorry to tell you, ma'am. He said, your boy's got such and such. And he's hopeless. He'll be this condition. You better put him in an institution. And I'd be probably dead in less than five years. And she went out from there just in a rage and said, Well, that's, I come, I'm not going to give this boy up. And he got worse and worse and kicking and screaming at night and foaming at the mouth and then half paralyzed and God knows what. And finally she brought him another doctor. He wanted to get another examination. And got the other doctor and she got the other doctor. He took a look at that kid. He took one look and said, Your boy's an advanced stage of, and name the same disease. And said, Was there any hope for him? He said, Absolutely none. And you know what she said after she got saved? She said, I didn't know what that word meant. Nobody ever told me that before. No hope. No hopes. I didn't know what the word meant. And the boy died. And uh, she got another little boy. And she got another little boy. And about that time, she began to think about spiritual things and try to find a way around, you know. And being raised Catholic, you know, she was hailing Mary and twiddling the beat and lighting the candles and all this stuff and getting nowhere. And that boy had another beautiful boy, got to be about five years old. And then one night she woke up in the middle of the night, he was there kicking the bed, you know, and twitching and eyes popped back in his head. And to make a long story short, a year later he began to foam at the mouth and vomit his food and everything. And she took him to the doctor and said, uh, What's wrong with the boy? He said, Well, I'm sorry he's got the same thing the other boy had. And he said, uh, There's no hope for him. And that fixed her. And that woman found Christ. 
And if she found Christ, the personal worker got to her and led her to Christ. And then she got reading the Bible, and about three years later, the boy died. And she spends her time going around home and holding women with Bible studies and stuff and leading women to Christ, and just her private life. And she's talking about how she realized that thing. She realized there was no hope. Listen, that Bible says that when an unsaved man dies, if he hasn't been born again and he's not in God's Son, he is without hope, hopeless, lost, lost. Uh, why does every preacher in America preach that? You lose too much of your congregation. Back in this country, people back in this country, oh, even, uh, oh, at the turn of the century, 1900, if an unsaved man got on a conviction, and really got, got on a conviction, why he'd uh, tear down the street, go down the street, and go to the Baptist church, and the Baptist preacher would stand up there and say, if you don't accept that Christ your Savior, you're going to go to hell, turn or burn, you better be hell scared and send a hell scorch. <laughs> she run out. <laughs> and go to Methodist church for relief. And there wasn't any relief in the Methodist church. The Methodist church would say, man, you ain't only going to hell. If you're on the safe, if you get saved, don't live right, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> there, boy. And he run down the street and get the Presbyterian church. No relief. A sinner couldn't put his foot in the ground in this country in 1900 comfortably. Hardly. And he run down the Presbyterian church, and I thought, sir, you I got the decree of reprobation. You can't be saved. You're predestinated to go to hell because Christ only died for the elect. You're going to hell again, man. <laughs> and the fellow run around like a wild man, couldn't get any relief. Now listen, listen. If you don't like what you're hearing tonight, and decide I'm full of baloney, you got over this. Listen to me. I'll tell you what you can do. You go out here anywhere, and I bet you within two miles of this church, or a mile. You can find a church to make you feel real good about yourself. And you won't have to worry about this thing ever again. And then when you wake up in the hell with some of those people, you wish you uh, hadn't done what you did. But that's what's going on. No hope. Alone, without hope, and without, without God. Uh, uh, Eric Marie Remarque wrote a great book one time called All Quiet in the Western Front. I read it through about 17 times. I believe if I had to recite it by memory, I couldn't do it verbatim, but I could come awful close to it. And that thing there is just a picture of an unsaved young man. And a good young man, not a wicked young man, a brave young man, brave soldier, honest young man, fine mother, loved his family, loved his mother, loved his father, a beating young man, brave young man, good soldier. And he goes through that hell of World War I, he fights at the end of it. And, of course, Eric is really writing a diary. He's not writing a fiction. He's writing a diary. He writes what he's been through, what he's seen, puts those anecdotes together. And when he's discussing what the war had done for his generation, he says this, quote, We're, We are forlorn like little children. We're experienced like old men. Like tradesmen, we understand distinctions. And like butchers, we understand necessities. We are burned up with hard facts. Our lives are superficially cast over an abyss of sorrow. I think we are lost. And they were. And they were. And I was too when I was in there. I think we are lost. Now, of course, he's not even talking about hell. He's just talking about the condition he's in. But that's the condition of every unsaved man in this world. All Quiet in the Western Front is not a story about some German in the last two years in World War One. That's the story of every cotton-picking, unsaved man in Europe, Asia, Africa, and all of South America. Without hope. No hope. Back there when Buchenwald was torn into and the Allies came in there in April of 1945 and liberated Dachau and Buchenwald and Treblinka in those concentration camps, they saw horrors you couldn't describe. And the men that saw them, uh, most of them never got over them after the war was over. They're still having nightmares about them. And when a Jewish rabbi named Schlechter with one of those army units came in there in the Buchenwald, and among other things, he was uh, going by a pile of dead bodies there, and a little boy, eight years old, crawled out of that pile of corpses who was still alive. And uh, the, the, the rabbi took him under his arm. You know, and got to talk with him. He was, he was, he was, uh, he was bursting into tears and crying. He wanted to calm the child. The child didn't act nervous, but he figured the kid would be probably just ready to have a fit. And the kid didn't respond much of anything. And finally he said, how old are you? That little eight-year-old boy said, I'm older than you are. 
That rabbi said, well, why do you say a thing like that? I'm 45 years old. And that little eight-year-old looked at him and said, you laugh like a boy, and you cry like a little boy. So I quit crying when I was five years old. He said, I quit laughing when I was five years old, and I don't even cry anymore. And I was older, you or me. Blap! Bitten up with hard facts. Just dealing with life. Just life. Lost. Lost, 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 lost. Somebody is going to get bound. You know what I'm drawing you? I'm drawing you a thing out of Matthew 13 that says, Take that fellow that came in here and bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I didn't write that. That's one of those verses the sex perverts have to get rid of. And the modernists and the liberals. Without hope, without hope, without hope. Uh, the, the, the thing about modern literature, really modern uh, fiction that's really interesting, is modern fiction is very realistic. And since it's very realistic and tries to, you know, tell the whole story and everything, hang out, that kind of thing, it nearly always ends on a negative note instead of a positive note. When I was a boy, all the good stories ended with, and so they lived happily ever after. You remember that? So they lived happily ever after. Now you pick up these new ones. Well, take a, take a, take a, they'll get a Nobel Prize winning literature. Take James Jones, uh, from here to eternity. It ends with a woman looking over the, in the stern of a ship, leaving Hawaii, and she throws her lay eye on there, her flowers, and the, and the, the tradition is if you see them drift back to the back end of the ship, you'll return, but if you don't, you won't return again. And she throws it over and it doesn't return again. And her little boy is standing by pulling her, her dress there. He's about 10 years old, and she's married to a colonel, and she's had to go back to the United States because Pearl Harbor has just been bombed. And she's taking the boy back with her. And he says, Mommy, he said, I'm not old enough to join the Army and fight in the war. And she says, Well, maybe you'll be old enough in the next one. And that's the end of the book. That's a good ending for a modern story. Just ends hopeless. That's very realistic. He was ready for the next one. Oh, well, a little bit up, a little bit further. He, he wasn't a draft agent in 50 when he went to Korea. I mean, five years later, he'd only been about 15 then. But then he'd have got in on Nam. Uh, you take one of those things, you take, a, you take, take any of those things like that. Uh, Norman Mailers, uh, The Naked and the Dead. I'm talking about Nobel Literary Prize winners. You get that, and the thing, you know what the last thing that, thing that is? After everybody's been shot up and torn up, you know, and betrayal, you know, and blackmail going on, and fights going on, and cussing all the way through it, and people getting killed, and falling off cliffs, and God knows what. You get there, and that thing, and you know what the last thing that is? It's a colonel who's found a new way to teach the troops map studies by pu putting a naked woman, a picture of a naked woman, behind the map, so they can look at her while they're studying the map. And when he looks at his finished work, he says, Hot diggity dog. <laughs> And that's the end of the book. You know how Gone with the Wind ends? Let Butler, frankly, my dear, I don't give up. And there's the end of the book. Good stuff. It's real. If you're here on a save tonight, you have no hope. You're alone without God in the world, and you don't know where you're going and how to get there. And that's just how it ought to end. Just like that, and that's how they end. But back in the old days, it was different. Oh, she, she and he walk off together, you know, in the moonlight, or they ride off on horseback in the sunlight as they go over the sunset trail. The 66-piece orchestra plays, you know, uh, I love you, you know, and they live happily ever after. <laughs> they call those fairy stories. I mean, real fairy, you understand? <laughs> not, your, not, your, not your news media fruit. I mean, a real fairy. They live happily. I like those stories. I like the ones that end right. And they're not realistic anymore because, honestly, people, their life doesn't end right. Without hope, without hope, without hope. That's what's going on. Here's it. I'll tell you something else about them. They're lost in the sin. Lost in the sin. The Bible said, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses, in trespasses, and sin, he says. Uh, being dead in your sins, you were quickened. That's what? That's brought back to life. That's what that is. 
You take that thing right. You take that thing right there. The, the unsaved man is lost in sin, and you sing it. You sing, "I was lost, was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. My little light from heaven filled my soul." The lost in sin. John chapter three says, "This is the condemnation that dark that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither cometh to it, lest his deeds should be reproved." He's saying that unsaved men don't come to the light, and therefore they die in their sins. Christ said, listen, if you believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. If I was preaching the United Nations tonight instead of you, I'd say it just like that. If you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. You die in your sins, or you die with your sins on Christ. And I wouldn't pull back a line of that for any Buddhist or Taoist or Hindu or humanist revolution anywhere in the world, coming or going. It wouldn't make any difference. You die inside of Christ, you die outside of Christ. If you're in Christ, you have everlasting life. Outside of Christ, you have no life, you have no hope. You're alone in the world without hope, without God. The question comes in, when you die, what then? Well, you're going to die with your sins on Christ, or you're going to die with your sins on yourself. You can figure that out. Well, when I'm not a great sinner, I didn't say you were. You said, I'm not a big sinner. I didn't say you were. I just said, you'll die in your sins. You do have some, don't you? Have you got some? <laughs> well, you'll die in them. Yeah, I like that, eh? All right, now you trust Christ your Savior. God takes your sins and puts them on His Son. People, religion doesn't even enter this. There's no church I'm talking about. I'm not talking about anything you read someplace about some church or somebody's faith. You die with your sins on you or on Christ. You said, I don't believe that. Well, then die and see how it comes out. <laughs> I mean, he never lied yet. I don't know why he'd lie about that. All right, they're lost in sin. And um, there's no, nothing is settled right till it's settled right with God. The Bible says the plowing of the wicked is sin. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Uh, that means legitimate work is sin. He didn't say it had, he didn't say the thing had anything to do with the killing anybody or robbing something. The plowing of the wicked. Plowing. Plowing. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Why is it? Because he was told, seek first the kingdom of God, and he's not doing it. He's making a living. He's out there working, going off like this. And the Lord said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteous, his righteousness, and all these things should be added to. I've got to make a living, got to make a living, got to get a crop. Got to get it out of the fire in the market. Got to make a living. Got to make a living. Sin. What it says. I wish, I'd preach, I wish people quit blaming me for everything that book says. I didn't write the book. So the plow of the wicked is sin. I know what you're supposed to do if you're not a saved man. You're not supposed to make a living. You're to seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things should be added to you. You worry about making a living after you get that right. All right, lost in sin. And there's something else about them. We're not through the condition yet. They're, they were rejected because they rejected the truth. You ever hear, you ever hear about a reject? And these are re rejected, absolutely. Did you ever get a rejection slip? You know, we used to call a round that didn't work in a, in a weapon. We called it a reject. You had to eject it because <laughs> it wouldn't fire. That's a reject. And the unsaved man is rejected. Rejected. A bunch of people show up there and they say, Lord, be done in your name mighty wonderful works. Mighty, we've cast out devils in your name and done many wonderful works in your name. And they're rejected. And they'll say, Depart me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. In Matthew 25, where you read in verse 41, it said, Depart me, you curse of everlasting fire. What is that? That's rejection. That's rejection. Uh, the, the last fortress in a man is his will. You can't break down the will in the will, in the in, in studying the will. You have rejected Christ willfully and deliberately, and then you pay the price. Christ said, how, how often I would have gathered you, and you would not. Christ said, whosoever will, let him come to me. You will not come to me. I can't change your will. We try. I mean, I preach at you. We'll give an invitation. We'll try to get you to come. But I, that's the last stroke. The stronghold of man is his, has, has his will, and I can't change it. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. 
I could stand up here and beg you and beg you and beg you if you came down that aisle to please me or to get by and didn't actually will receive Christ, it wouldn't do you any good anyway. Men deliberately reject the truth. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Uh, you take men deliberately reject the truth, you know they do, the way, the way history keeps repeating itself. Who that knew history and faced the facts would take the course America is taking today? Nobody. That's a deliberate rejection of the truth. The stuff is done on purpose. Uh, they, why, why, I, think, I think the newspapers, media think the trouble of America today is, is Christians. <laughs> We're right-wing extremists, you know, that kind of thing. Why? Well, I, I don't know of any Bible-believing people that uh, help the drug traffic. I know them all this country. I've preached for this country 54 years, 40,000 miles a year, just in airplanes. I don't many Christians around here pushing the drug traffic, not those that believe the book. I don't find any there helping out abortions or helping out BD or helping pass around AIDS. I don't many. I don't know who's behind the devil, but it sure isn't a bunch of Bible believing Christians. Let me ask you this Was America ever a great country? You still think it's great now? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to fill in it for you, fill in your own blanks. Uh, I will ask you this, if it was ever a great country, what made it great? I'll ask you this. If it's not a great country now, right now, why isn't it? I'll ask you this. If it still is a great country, tell me what made it great. Yeah, face it. See, face it. No, don't stand there and just say, well, I still think it's the best place to live. I mean, you got food in your belly and money in your pocket. Don't give me that. Tell me what made it that way. Let me ask you something. What have you seen on television in the last 40 years promoted continually that made na America a great nation? Now, listen to what I said. I said promoted continually. I said all four channels, 24 hours a day, pushing something. What does the news media push all day long? You know those, what those items are? Why don't you go home and write them down? And tell me which one of those made America a great country. And your answer is zip. A hundred to zip. Now, nothing the news media ever pushed continually for the last 40 years that made any country a great country. You just don't face the truth. You've got to look at it. You don't like it. It's negative. That's what men are like. They don't want the truth. They have nothing to do with it. I preached in a Brushy Mountain prison up in Tennessee. I went up there and tried to get a... I got a hold of James Earl Ray and met him, but... That's before he died, and he tried to escape three or four times before he died. And he was so bitter, he wouldn't take time out to talk with me. He shook my hand and said, glad to meet you, and left. And I tried to get I won't talk to him for a while about some things. He wrote a book called Tennessee Waltz, where he explained some things that aren't explained in the newspaper, but I didn't get a chance to. But I preached in Brushy Mountain Prison. We had, uh, we had about four or five fellows saved up there. I had a good meeting. First time I went up there and had the meeting, a bunch of the prisoners came to me and said, we didn't know you was coming. What are you doing here? I said, well, didn't your chaplain tell you I was coming? No, I didn't think about you coming. We'd have been in the, in the meeting if, you'd, if he told us. And the next time, next year, they put the pressure on him. He got me in. The next year, he wrote and said, we can't have you back. We can't have your heretical teaching taught in our prisons. You know, that kind of thing. Rejecting the truth. Upset them. You know what they teach most of those prisoners? I know what they teach them. They teach the saved guy if they can lose their salvation. You know why they're teaching that? Because they figure if they get worried about going to hell the way they work, they'll obey and do better because they're worried about losing their salvation. So they make them a nicer jail where they don't have as much trouble. They let them believe a lie. And use that's, that's what is called extortion. You scare the guy out of his salvation if he doesn't do right because you want him to do right for your convenience. We got the winners, boy. We got the winners. What made America great? Was it pushing gun control? You think I made a about it? What made America great? Pushing women's lib? Just tell me. I'm real open minded. Just show me. Show me a nation was made great by pushing women ch children's rights. Is that what made America a great nation? Who are you trying to kid your grandmother? <laughs> why? Why? When I came up, kids didn't have any rights, man. 
I came, I, I've got to come that far to get shot by the police at night. If I'd been shot, I'd been too bad, and I wasn't 16 years old. But that put when I was up, the policeman said, Halt in the name of the law. And if you didn't halt, <laughs> one got your foot or over your head. And the second one went through your back if you were running. <laughs> it went through your belly if you're going the wrong way. Uh, 14 years old, tough apples. That'll teach you, right? Don't run around late at night when the lights are off. <laughs> Children's rights. <laughs> Boy, I could have made me a million bucks with the, with the laws we have now. I could have come home and showed my family, boy, about once every two weeks, and I made blood running off it. I mean, literally, boy. I mean, walking over your pants, your underwear sticking to you. <laughs> this man, if a woman can clean up two million dollars from the government for dumping coffee on herself, boy, think what I could have done with a bleeding butt there sticking out like that. <laughs> I sure miss, I sure missed my opportunity, didn't I? <laughs> that's what that thing is. It's a refusal to face facts. Did you know any Catholic in this world can find Psalm 69 in his Bible? Any Catholic. Any Roman Catholic can find Psalm 69 in his Bible. You know what Psalm 69 says? Christ talking there says, I'm an alien of my mother's children. In Psalm 69. Mary had kids. They're listed in Mark chapter 6 in the New Testament. He had four brothers and a couple of sisters. And they're named. Somebody won't face it. See? So I put this to you. You going to face it? You know why men go to hell? They won't face the truth. They hide. Like Adam and Eve, hiding behind the bushes. And that isn't all. There's something else about this unsaved fellow. This man without hope, without God. He's under, he's under the wrath of God, and according to John chapter 3, verse 36, the wrath of God stays on him. He said, Abides. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth, abideth. That's home. Stay there. Abideth on him. Uh, some people don't believe in the wrath of God anymore. And you preach about it, everybody get nervous in the service, and I don't think you should preach that. You're just driving men from Christ, and... Oh, there's a lot of baloney going on today. And say, well, I've, I've, God isn't a God of wrath. God's a God of love. God is love. He that loveth is blah, 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 blah. That Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall in the hand of the living God. Our God is consuming fire. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And the wrath of God abides. And when the wrath of God gets loose, it's not going to stop. That, the, that, that happens often in human nature. People get to places where they get so angry and get mad, they kill somebody or blow up and explode, and lose all control of themselves. You say, well, God's not going to lose control of himself. No, but he'll let, he'll let things go, and they'll, they'll get out of control. What do you think goes on in the, in the army and in war and torture and all this stuff that goes on up and down this world when God can stop it and doesn't stop it? I mean, here's somebody here screaming, they're getting skinned like a deer, and they're screaming, or here the kid back in the other room, they're pounding their fingers off with a sledgehammer and they're screaming. Why doesn't God stop it if he's love? You're not thinking. You're not thinking. God can get fed up to where he just lets it go. When Lawrence of Arabia came and was fighting there and fighting with the Arabs against the Turks, they came to a place where the Turks had been through there and killed men, women, and child and everything. And they found one of their sergeants who had been killed, and they'd, the Turks had taken him and, and bayoneted him to the ground. They taped him to the ground and run bayonets through his, uh, his uh, legs and arms, pinning him to the ground, and he was still alive when they came in there. And he was, he was dying. He told about the slaughter that took place where the Turks went through. And while they were talking there, a little girl ran out of a pile of dead men there right while they were talking. And... This fellow, whose name is Hassan, Sergeant Hassan, said, he said, he couldn't fulfill his what he wanted to, but he said, I'd like to give a medal to every man who kills, to a man who kills the most Turks. <laughs> and boy, about two days later, they called up with that bunch that massacred that village. And they came in there, Lawrence of Arabia tried to control his men, he waved his hand, 
and said, take prisoners, take prisoners, don't kill them, don't kill them, and he couldn't stop his men from killing them. Those men went through there, and they killed every cotton picking jerk there. They spread just like a bunch of wild men, crazy men. He waved his hand right there in the middle of a hail of bullets, and nothing could stop their wrath. You know what God's been doing for years and years and years and centuries? He's been using the nations to punish each other. You'll see a little uh, sign on my car, you know what it says? I know you, a lot of you have those signs. i got one that says, War is God judgment on a sin here. Hell is God judgment on a sin hereafter. Would God let a fellow like that be pitched into a fire? Yes, yeah, sure he would. He let Shadrach, Meshach, and Medigo go in. They were good folks. <laughs> yeah, but I don't tell you all the ones that got thrown there that weren't good folks. You got burned up. And God lets that kind of thing happen. You say, why? Once the wrath of God is turned loose, you can't stop it. It burns like fire. He says, uh, my anger is kindled and shall burn my f- anger will burn the lowest hell. What's the problem? The problem is the basic trouble with human nature is self-love. That's the problem. I mean, uh, these are this is the wrath of God in the fella, and the, you say, why is it? It's because, among other things, this fella is what we call an eternal misfit. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, if you're unsaved, you wouldn't fit in heaven. If you could get there, you'd be a misfit. You'd be out of place as a adult hitter at a Jewish wedding. <laughs> you'd be out of place. You'd be like a like Eskimo growing a banana tree. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you wouldn't belong. If you got to heaven, you just think you'd like heaven, you wouldn't like heaven at all. Well, what would you do when you got up there? You'd send to see somebody who loved you enough to die for you, and you wouldn't trust him, and you wouldn't believe on him. How do you think you and him get along? Pretty good? They're eternal misfits. It's uh, like a Bible study at a rock concert. <laughs> it don't fit. They're forever a misfit. If if uh, Muhammad could get to heaven, uh, you think he'd fit in there? If he got there, he'd be getting to paradise, hoping he gets up there and have a couple dozen virgins to shack up with, you know, while his other 14 wives watch it, I guess. But you take Muhammad, if he got to heaven, how would he fit him in that place there? They're up there praising Allah. They're up there singing, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. And Muhammad raising his hand, Allah Akbar, you know, what's the idea of making a God of Jesus Christ, you bunch of idolaters? Jesus Christ was just a prophet like me. They say, pitch him out. Pitch him out. And out he go. He says in Matthew, bind him hand and foot and cast him out of darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnash of teeth. An eternal misfit. And that isn't to, to say it all the way. To say it all the way is to say, uh, to say it all the way to say he's rejected finally. Absolutely. That is, he says, the smoke of their torment ascends up ever, forever and ever. Depart from you, curse of everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. And he says, those that come up this time, come up to the shame, to the, uh, the resurrection of shame and everlasting, 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 everlasting contempt. They're rejected totally and completely. Which is saying what? They're lost. They're lost to what? They're lost to God. They're lost to themselves. They're lost to humanity. What are they? They're lost. Just like the book says. They're lost. They're lost, and they're lost for good, finally and forever, and they don't ever recover. That's the picture of a lost man. Who would that be? You say, well, well, you know anybody? When I got saved... When I got saved, one of my friends, he was most of my friends back in those days were, before I was saved, were Roman Catholics. And I went back right and witnessed to all of them after I got saved. And one of them, was, his name is Al Alois. And I was talking to him about these things, and I was telling him about how I got saved and trusted Christ. And I said, do you believe that Christ died for your sins? And he said, oh, I believe he died for everybody's sins. I said, I didn't ask you. I said, I believe he died for yours. He said, well, he died for the sins of the whole world. I said, yeah, but he died for you. He said, well, he died for everybody. <laughs> well, I said, you say everybody? He said, everybody. I said, well, all right. Name me the name of one man that Jesus Christ died for. And he couldn't do it. 
I said, I can tell you the name of a man he died for. And I said, who's that? I said, Peter S. Ruffman. You see, there's a difference in believing John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There's a difference between that. And as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the Son of the God, even then believe on his name. You can leave all that stuff, but do you receive it? That's the stuff. What man does, he invents religions to get around receiving it. This man is totally rejected. What's the word for that? I know what the word for that is. Lost. L-O-S-T. Well, if he comes up out of hell, he's been down there for a while. I mean, hell doesn't empty in the lake of fire, you know, for another thousand years. I guess you know that, don't you? And when the fellow comes out of hell, he comes out of there in his filthy rags, rotten smoke, sulfur, brimstone coming off him, I suppose. Been down there all that time. Comes up, Lord, white throne judgment. Says, all right, lake of fire, that's where your father is. That's where you're going. Now out you go. And he says, but don't, 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 don't send me there. But he says, I'm sorry, you're, raw, you're lost. Turn to the recording angel, says, write it down. Lost or saved. That's what they wrote when the Titanic went down. I don't know why they wouldn't write it up in glory. When the Titanic went down, all those post offices all over New England and England had big signs on them. There were two lists there. And the first one said, Lost. Well, they said saved. And that's all the two lists were. That's the only kind of people are. Lost, saved. If they went down with the Titanic, they were lost. If they got out alive, they were saved. And that's all there was to it. Write down lost, L-O-S-T. Don't do it, you'll say. Lord well, says, write it down. He said, don't, don't, don't do it. I, I did the best I could. I mean, what about the heathen? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I wasn't talking about these things. What about the folks that never heard about the gospel? I mean, I, I wasn't one of the elect. I mean, I did the best I could. I mean, I was sincere. I mean, if you just give me a... Write it down. Devil take one look at you and smile and take one look at himself. And that recording angel could have written down your name in heaven. I have a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, I know it's mine. And the white roan angel sing the story, a sinner has come home. A new name written down in glory, and it's mine, it's mine. There was a time when the books of heaven up there, my sins were there, unforgiven, my name was at the top, and many things below, I went up to the keeper and settled it long ago. I got this thing settled. I got my name in the Lamb's book of life. That's better than who's who. Write it down. It could have been saved. It wasn't. Lost. And when we say lost, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about you winding up in a rescue mission. We're not talking about you winding up in a hospital. We're not talking about you losing your health or losing your wife or losing your kids. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about you going down with a ship or having a terrible automobile accident. We're not talking about that. We talk about loss. We're talking about your soul. What should a prophet a man if he gain his own, the whole world and lose his own, son, or his own soul? Now, you know what I'm drawing you here? I'm drawing you a fellow here who uh, fell under Matthew 13. He said, when the Lord comes back, he says, that bunch of unsaved people, he says, they're useless. They're to be, they're evil figs, Jeremiah. They're tares to be put in bundles to be burned, Matthew. They're, we're talking about being rejected not by your wife. Not by your mother. Oh, my parents didn't accept me. Society didn't accept me. I was rejected. We're not talking about that. We're talking about your maker throwing you out. We're talking about the one that made you and gave you birth. He said, take that fellow and take him and listen. I'm quoting. Bind him hand and foot. That's what it says. There and there. Bind him hand and foot. This is Bible. Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. There should be wailing, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. My Bible says that uh, lake of fire is like sulfur and brimstone. And I can remember how it was back in uh, college when I was taking organic chemistry. You went by a Bunsen burner, and they had to have a little sign on it saying it was lit because you couldn't see the flame. Flame's invisible. 
It could be out in darkness, a lake of fire, and you don't see the fire. I'm just drawing that there for you so you know where that fellow's going. What is that fellow? That fellow's lost. Right lost. Rejection. Rejection. Well, I'm about through. And the question is this. The question is, if you died tonight, would you die in your sins, or would you die in God's Son? When I say in God's Son, I mean, have you accepted Him as your Savior? Do you know Him as your Savior? And you know if you denied tonight, He'd take you back, because He's yours, and you're His. That's a personal transaction. That's why we say people, whatever they may say about us, we always say, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal See how we say it? As your personal Savior. Why do we say that? Because it's a person to person, it's a one on one transaction. It doesn't go through a priest. It doesn't through, go through Mary. It doesn't go through a church. It's a one on one transaction where you accept what God did for you through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if that has not happened in your life, you are, I'm quoting, you are L O S T lost. All right, we're going to stand a minute and sing an invitation song, and I want to get the invitation clear. We have some coming for baptism tonight, but I'm not giving an invitation for baptism right now. I'm giving an invitation for any man, any woman, any child in this building. You're not sure that you have accepted Christ your Savior, received Him as your Savior. I'm giving you the invitation tonight, while we sing, to step forward, come forward, have a word of prayer here at the altar, and by your coming, by your coming simply telling us and telling the Lord that you are receiving His Son as your Savior. Is that clear? No no hooks, no gimmicks, okay? No catches, no hooks, nothing. nothing no, there's no Benny Hinn evangelistic telecast TV evangelist going on here. We're not talking about that. We're talking about you as a sinner receiving God's Son as your Savior. Let's stand. Let's stand, let's sing, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. If you'd like to have somebody come with you, why, come with them. If you're here tonight, you're with an unsaved person, ask them if they wouldn't like to come. And the invitation is clear, you can't miss, you can't miss, you can't miss. Nobody's trying to get your money, nobody's trying to get your membership. You're not getting a con job here, you never have, you never will. I've shot straight with you. I've shot maybe at the cost of my own reputation, but that means nothing to me anyway. You going to shoot straight with me? Well, have you received Christ your Savior? If you haven't, will you receive me as your Savior? Let's sing it out. Just as I am, without one plea, without thy blood, And that thou bid me come to thee. All right, it's an old, old story, but that's what we're to. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? Well, I don't know. But Lord, will he, Lord, will he going to find it here? What I'm preaching to you is just what Sunday preached to him in 1933, just what Moody preached to him in 1890, that's just what George Whitfield preached to him in 1800, that's just what John Wesley preached to him in 1770. Same old stuff. That's what Chrysostom preached to him in 400 A.D. He preached that God's Son died for your sin, shed His blood. You take Him as your Savior. Your sins are paid for, and they're covered by His blood. And when you die, you won't be cast out of His presence into a lake of fire. Oh, I've seen just Simon waiting now. Just as Anybody, come ahead. Come ahead. If you will, come and confess Christ, receive Christ. Come ahead. I can't change your will. That's the last stronghold. The last stronghold in there. I know what I'm getting right now. 
Not tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight. Over there across the bay there in Milton, Florida, we had a preacher. He's dead now. But he's a good preacher. Jack Wood from Texas was preaching over there one night. I'd have found that church about 65 years old, married to a Christian woman. She'd been praying for him for years, and he's a good fellow. Paid his bills, took care of his family, all that kind of thing. But he wouldn't uh, accept Christ. And every time they talked to him about it, he'd say, he admitted, I'm a very stubborn man, which he was. And the last revival they had over there before he died, he'd had a little light heart attack about two years before, and they put a lot of pressure on him to get saved, and he wouldn't get saved. And the last, well, about second or next to last meeting they had over there on a Saturday night or something, he was visibly shaken, going out toward the door. Jack wouldn't got a hold of him again and said, Sir, wouldn't you like to accept Christ your Savior? And he said, I'm a very stubborn man, preacher, and took about four steps and dropped. And they got the medics going, got him over there, and he wasn't comatose yet or anything, but they got a hold of him, and while he was getting ready to put him in the van, take him off, Jack said to him, he said, Sir, before you go, can we have a prayer and you accept Christ? And those glazed eyes look at him, and that old man said, I'm a very stubborn man, preacher, and he was dead before they got to the hospital. That's a dumb thing to do. But it's, dumb, it's dumb to be that stubborn. And you never had a better chance than you have right tonight except Christ. So, air conditioning on, no torm, or steam heater, or whatever it's supposed to be right now. Got a good light, got a good seat to sit on. Got good music, people praying for you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. We may not sing another stanza. Let's just wait a while. Let the Lord deal with you here. I'd like to have the musicians play something for us while we wait. And I'm not going to argue with you all night. I'm going to try to convince you. Very shortly, God's going to convince you. And He's going to show you if I told you the truth or didn't. Don't you worry. If I lied to you, He'll tell you real quick. And if I told you the truth... He'll show you what you should have done you didn't do. And then it'll be too late. Let's pray a little while. There's a prayer room back there on my left. Maybe you'd like to go back there with somebody and have prayer and get settled back there. If you don't want to be, if you like going to be embarrassed in public, go back there. If you know where a Christian is, say, uh, I'd like to go down if you'll go with me and come on. Anywhere in the building? If not, we're going to close. He said, I didn't say it, he said, bind him. I got him bound. Hand and foot. I got him bound. And cast him out of darkness. There's the darkness. And he said, Depart you, cursed, and there he goes, into everlasting fire that wasn't prepared for him or prepared for you. He was prepared for the devil and his angels. Anybody? Anywhere? All right, Father, bless the message. May the Word of God find root in somebody's heart and bear forth fruit to eternal life. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, before you go, well, there's some people coming to get baptized tonight. If you just wake your way to make your way to the dressing room, I think a couple here, uh, men over here, and men and boys over here, and ladies over here, be baptized tonight, and we have a brief baptismal service. If you'd like to stay, be glad to have you stay. And if you have to go somewhere quick, why don't feel bad about leaving? We won't think you're backslidden. But uh, some to get baptized, ladies, girls over here, any men or boys over here on this side. All right, you're dismissed.